God bless you, Dawes Road family, and the Lord bless you, those of you who've tuned in online as well. We're looking forward to getting into the precious, precious Word of God. I trust you have your Bibles. Our main portion of focus is going to be Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, third book in the New Testament, Luke chapter 3. Since the message of John the Baptist, the announcer, the announcer that would make sure that we knew that Jesus was coming, and the message of Jesus himself is identical in words, then it might be a good idea to know what the word repent means. Both John the Baptist and Jesus, we see this in Matthew chapter 3, and then in Matthew chapter 4, uh, John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, and then Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, same words. Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. So what does this word repent mean? What does it look like? And in our scriptures today, we'll take a little bit of a look at that. So hang in there with me as we look into the precious word of God and may God's rich blessing be upon you. And Father, may this not be just a study of the mind. But Father, we pray that you would be glorified by, by the working of your Holy Spirit uh, moving in us, um, bringing your baptism, your fire into our lives, transforming us so that the word repent is not just a, a word that we say with our lips, but actions and fruit that is produced in our lives. Grant great grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. And we want to pick it up. It, I mean, the, the, the reason why Luke wrote his gospel account, the gospel account of the life and ministry of Jesus, is so that we would know the certainty of the truth. Again, so many voices out there, so many false religions, false uh, deceptions, false gods, false prophets, false teachers, false messiahs are out there. And they're all saying, I'm the way, and it's our religion, and so on. And, and how, do you, how do you sort through that? And many of us kind of just kind of given up, and well, it doesn't really matter. I'll come up with my own, my own kind of eclectic uh, religion, my own eclectic philosophy, a little bit here and a little bit there, and, and, and I'll just make it work for me. And that kind of, and, but actually, if we want an eternal relationship with the eternal God, we need to know the truth because we have to do it God's way. And God wants to cut through all the confusion, all the lies, all the deception, and give you the truth. And that's why he had Luke write this, write this gospel account, so that you may know, that you may know that you have the truth. Now, one of the techniques that God put into Luke to make sure that we would know the truth is that it is announced ahead of time, it makes sense, and uh, is verified. And as we look into chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, God does that. As a matter of fact, that's what, uh, what John does, or sorry, what Luke does, is he's telling us the story of the one who would announce that Jesus is coming. We had looked previously at the fact that, uh, that God's challenge to the false idols, the false uh, philosophers and so on, of, of years gone by, 700 years actually before these events should take place, and challenging them. Well, if you're if you're so smart, if you, if it's your way, if you're the gods, your philosophy, your your religion, well, then just just announce something ahead of time, and so that we can be in awe. Oh, you must have the truth. And God, it's almost if it wasn't so serious, it would be funny in Isaiah chapter forty-one, verse twenty-one, down to the end of the chapter. It would be almost funny, but it's not funny because none of them. No other religion, no other way can actually determine ahead of time what will happen except for God. So when God announces that his salvation is coming, he's announcing his truth is coming, he is announcing that Jesus is coming to be our Savior, and it happens, then we can be absolutely sure of the truth. And I want to say hallelujah to that. We've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks, and one of our precious brothers who has not been able to be with us now on Sunday mornings, but he's part of our online family, and he listens to the sermons and the four-minute Bible boosters on a regular basis, and just recently he sent me a note, and, I, and, and, I, and he's given me permission to share this note with you, so let me just take a, a moment to share this note with you. He says, good afternoon, Pastor Arnie. Hope you are doing great by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Thank you so much for the message. The genealogy, the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, Jesus' life fulfilling them all, along with his birth and resurrection, makes him the true Messiah. In no other faith other than Christianity, uh, do we have such a powerful man in words, in deeds, and in prophecies, fulfilling the past ones and predicting the future ones with such pre pre uh, precision as Jesus Christ. No one taught him. He was the teacher. No angel gave him a message. He was the message. No one gave him the power to perform miracles. He had the power in him. He could see crystal clear what was in each individual's hearts and thoughts. Even nature obeyed him. No man that walks the earth or any so-called prophets of man-made religions come to even 10% of what Jesus did. <laughs> um, Sergio, uh, and I think you would agree with me, <laughs> we could certainly minimize that number <laughs> very easily. And I think he was just being very, very generous. Um, less than 1%. Uh, 0 0.0001%. Because think about that. I, I mean, sure, men say they have done miracles. But miracles were... Uh, almost a daily occurrence with Jesus. He would teach and he would heal. He would do miracles almost on a daily basis. People would flock from all over the country and beyond the borders to come to see Jesus for healing because he was the Son of God. He was God clothed in the flesh. So <laughs> no man that walked the earth or any so-called prophets of man-made religions come to even 10% of what Jesus did his supernatural power, all that he's still doing today. All men, false prophets, who made all the religions to deceive the world are all dead. But Jesus is the only one who is alive and well. And amazingly, most religions acknowledge him being alive. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> May the Lord continue to bless your, min your ministry blessings. Praise God. You see, God gave us the truth and he wanted us to make sure that we knew the truth and that it was clear that we had the truth. God wants us to be absolutely certain that we have the truth so that we have the confidence of having a right relationship with, with him. And that truth is Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. So again, one of the ways that God helps us understand that we have the truth is that he's announced what he was going to do ahead of time. As a matter of fact, in uh, Luke chapter 3, um, we take a look at these, the, these, the, this amazing chapter, the first part of the chapter anyways, and we see that he's actually sent an, an announcer ahead of time to say that Jesus is coming. Uh, and, and then Jesus appears on the scene. So Jesus didn't just pop up and say, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one. No, no, no. There was an announcer who would actually say, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's here. And only God can do that. Absolutely amazing. So in Luke chapter 3, we already have verifications and, um, uh, and all of that kind of thing because Luke puts it very much in a historical context, a time frame and a geography and so on by the first few verses. And we've looked at that briefly. Uh, verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. They were all known, well-known uh, well characters in Luke's day. Now, we may not know some of these characters. Now, we have uh, some pretty good information on Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate. He was the one that was responsible for writing the execution order for the death of Jesus when Jesus died on the cross. So we'll see more of Pontius Pilate in pages to come in the gospel accounts. Um, uh, Herod, we're going to read a little bit more about Herod and, and Philip, um, in, 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 indeed, even in this chapter. Um, uh, Licinius, we have no idea who that guy is, uh, except that he's a tetrarch. And there was a li another Licinius there, but he wasn't a, he wasn't a ruler. Um, but we finally found some inscriptions saying that there was a Licinius, another Licinius, that was a tetrarch. So uh, we may not have any documentation, we may know nothing about him, but there is inscriptions that he was actually a historical figure, which just confirms again just gives verification that what Luke was saying was true. But the point is that, that his readers at that particular time in the first century would have been very, very, very well knowledgeable of these characters. 
And it's kind of like, oh, okay. During this time, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been 30 years since these events have taken place. But yeah, we we know these men. We know this history. Oh, and so you're putting it right there. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. This is not fantasy land. This is not just some made-up story. This is a concrete historical truth that, that, uh, that, uh, that Luke is sharing so that we would know with certainty that we'd have the truth of God, that Jesus is the way. It says here in verse 3 that he went into the country around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So here's now the announcer that's going to announce that Jesus is coming. He begins now preaching around the Jordan River. And not in Jerusalem, not in the cities, but in the countryside. Um, uh, and, and begins this preaching ministry, uh, a, a ministry of, uh, a, of a baptism of repentance. People are repenting and they're getting baptized. Now, Matthew adds a few more details. Matthew and, and, and Luke here are kind of a parallel passages here. Let me read a few verses from Matthew chapter three. It fills in kind of some of the details. Uh, and probably the reason why Luke doesn't fill in these details is because Luke is writing to uh, quite a broad audience. Matthew is writing to some Jewish people. And so as he describes, for instance, what John the Baptist, the announcer, is eating and wearing, it's kind of like, oh, this sounds like that Old Testament prophet from hundreds of years earlier. His name is Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. There is Moses and there is Elijah, right? <laughs> it sounds like that. But, but Luke is writing to a very broad audience. They may not be that familiar with some of the Old Testament characters and stories. So he doesn't mention these details, but Matthew does. So let me, let me read some of these details for you in Matthew chapter 3. And uh, verse, let me start at verse one. In those days, see, Matthew's not nearly as concerned about geography and timeline. <laughs> He's writing to the Jewish people. So um, um, that would be fixed in their mind and in their hearts anyway. So he just, he just assumes that they know that. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who, who has spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Of course, Luke has expanded on that, given us more of those verses in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, because he would, he would end by saying, and all people will see God's salvation. Um, Matthew didn't have to write that. Luke does. That's the whole point of the announcer coming, so that we would see God's salvation. We would see God's way to be saved, to be part of God's eternal family and his eternal, in his eternal presence. And of course, that way of salvation is Jesus. But Matthew would go on to say, John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his, his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. And that would remind the Jewish audience of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up with the chaff with unquenchable fire. That was John the Baptist ministry. So let's get back to Luke chapter three, parallel, almost identical in, in many of the phrases and many of the words there because Luke is recording the same things, but he, uh, he adds some details for us to really help us to grab hold of some of these amazing truths. Um, it says here, let me go back to Luke chapter three and verse three, and it says this, that he went into, that's he, that's John. John went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now that's amazing, he's preaching a baptism of repentance. You need to change. You need to change your ways. The word repent simply means a change of mind, a change of direction, a change of heart. 
That's what it means. And if that's what you're really going to do, then show it by being baptized. Um, now, and, 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 and if you really repent, your sins will be forgiven. As a matter of fact, John's message and Jesus' message are identical. Uh, I, I think we've already said that, right? <laughs> Matthew chapter 3, John says, <laughs> repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 4, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, they, they, you need to repent. There needs to be change. If you're going to find forgiveness and people were being baptized. Now, I, I want you to see how startling that is. Startling. And, and you'll actually see it in some of the phrases that, that we'll, we'll, we'll come to um, in verse 7 and following. In verse 7 and following. Um, because the Jewish people didn't think they needed to be <laughs> baptized. I, I mean, baptism in John's day and in Jesus' day was left for people who wanted to convert to Judaism. They wanted to become part of God's people. So they were Gentiles of the nations. They weren't born a Jew. They wanted to become a Jew so they could be part of the family of God. And so one of the things that would happen is that they would, of course, take some vows and the men would be circumcised and then they would be baptized, as it were, cleansing the filth of being unclean, unqualified as Gentiles of the nations. And then that, 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 that sort of, in a picture way, that, that cleansing, getting rid of all the old uh, unclean ways, the unclean uh, taint of being a Gentile and now becoming a Jew. So I'm part of the family of God. John is saying, you need to be baptized. You Jewish people need to be baptized. Now, for some reason, and of course, we can attribute this only to the work of the Spirit of God. People were convicted in their hearts, and they knew that no matter how religious they were, how faithful they were to Sabbath worship, how faithful they were in giving their sacrifices and their tithes and their offerings and so on, their hearts often were not close to God at all. They were just doing it because that was part of their culture. It was part of their religion. They were Jewish, for, for goodness sake. So that's what they were supposed to do. And they thought that, that would make them okay. And John says, no, you need to repent. If you want to be forgiven, you need to repent. And if you're serious about that, then get into the, the, the waters. Let's see that picture of your sins being washed away, and he would baptize them in the Jordan River. Wow, wow. Let me, let me pick it up at verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Now in that mixed crowd would be Pharisees and Sadducees, and then the people, a lot of the people held the Pharisees, the Sadducees up high, but they were often a cunning, sneaky, um, Oh, they would couch their words and their actions in religious terms, but their heart was so far from God. And so John, seen through all of their religiosity, cut right through it. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? You see, there is a judgment coming. Every person will have to give an account to God. I hope you realize that. You're going to have to give an account to God. And he is holy. Where is that going to leave you? Where is that going to leave you? Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You need to change. But your change can't be just sort of a, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, I believe you, John. No, 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 no. It's going to be demonstrated in your life. Wow. And do not begin to say to yourselves, like it's kind of like, well, I don't need to really worry about this. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, because he was kind of the father of the Jewish faith. We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise a children up for Abraham. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to be his people. God can turn stones into people and make them his kingdom and his family. God doesn't need you. So if you want to be part of God's family, there needs to be a change in you. Jewish or Gentile, you, Jew or Gentile, Jew or out of the nations, you need to repent. And there needs to be actions that show that you are repenting. Verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the trees. What a picture. The, root, the axe is already at the root of the trees. 
the tree is about to go down. Your old religious system, your old philosophy, your old way of doing things you think for God are, are, are gone. And if you don't get your act together, you're going to be chopped down and not be in existence anymore. Instead, be burned into the judgment. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow, wow. Now, Matthew doesn't record this next little section here, but Luke wants us to help, help Luke, sorry, excuse me, Luke wants us to understand repentance. Now, Luke later on in his book, and it's, it's couched in a beautiful story, tells us what the moment of repentance looks like. That change of mind and heart. And, and he records one of the, the, the teaching stories of Jesus. Actually, it's a trilogy of stories where Jesus pours out his heart, his heart of love, the love of the Father and the love of Jesus for you. And there's the story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin that the owners spare no expense to find and bring back. And then there's a rejoicing, there's a party. <laughs> and then there's the third part of the story, and it's the lost son. It's not a lot. Not, not, not that he wandered away, he rebelliously went his own way, disrespected his dad, saying, Dad, I <laughs> implied, Dad, I wish you were dead because I want your money. I can't wait for you to die so I can get my inheritance. What a nasty thing to think. Now, he didn't say that, but he, said, he did say, I want my share of the inheritance because he wanted to do his own thing. Uh, implied is, Dad, I wish you were dead so I can get, my, get a, hit, a hold on, 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 on the money that's coming to me so I can do my own thing. And after being pestered so long, Dad finally, finally gives his son the share that he's supposed to get. This dad has two sons, an older son, who by Jewish law would actually get two, two parts of the inheritance, and the remaining sons would get one part of the inheritance. Since there was two sons, the older son would get two-thirds, and the younger son would get one third, and still a huge amount. But you know the story. I mean, this son took his, took his share of the inheritance, went out there and had wild parties, prostitutes and parties and all that kind of stuff, friends and all that kind of thing, all galore. And then all of a sudden, a economic downturn, a famine hits, and all his friends run away. He's got nothing. The only job he can finally find for a Jewish boy, absolutely despicable, was to feed the pigs. Pigs were considered unclean animals. You didn't touch them. You didn't, you didn't eat their meat. It's kind of like, oh, my goodness. If you, if you touched one of their carcasses, you would be unclean till, till, till sunset, and you'd have to wash your clothes, all that. It, it, I mean, they just stayed away from pigs. And the only job he could find was feeding pigs. But then you get the moment of repentance. There's a moment of repentance. And Luke expands that for us. Now, not that we have to all go through this, this entire mindset of these five steps of that moment of repentance. For most of us, it's all just wrapped up into one. But, but Luke wonderfully records Jesus uh, uh, parsing it out a bit for us, expanding the, 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 the thinking process here. And we find it wonderfully. It says here, verse 17, when he came to his senses. When he came to his senses. See, sometimes we're so wrapped up in our lives that we've lost sight of the big picture of eternity and our relationship with God. He says, when he came to his senses, he says in the next verse, I will go back to my father. See, that's, that's the change of mind. That's the change of heart. That's the change of direction. I'll go back to my father. And then I'll admit, I've sinned. I'm the one to blame. Not you, Dad. Not the world. Not my friends. Not my family. Me. Me. We're, we're in this generation too quick to point the blame at someone else. We're always trying to find someone else to take the blame. Uh, I, no matter where you turn. That, it just seems to be part of human nature right from the very beginning. Blame someone else. But you can't repent unless you take personal responsibility and say, yes, I lied. I lusted. I stole. I wasn't truthful. I was prou proud. 
I was vengeful. I had, I had thoughts of revenge in my heart. I know it, it, and, and maybe someone did some hurt to me, but I have to take responsibility for my actions and reactions and my, my emotions and my, wow. And he said, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and against you. And then he acknowledges his humility. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Some of us are crying out, God, you've got to do it. I, I, I'm pretty good. Not as bad as that guy, so you've got to do something. No, 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 no. True repentance says I'm not worthy at all. Just humbly, being completely vulnerable to God and saying, God, I'm coming to you. And then, <laughs> verse 20, don't forget this last one. He got up and went to his father. You actually got to do it. You got to say, Jesus, I've sinned. Jesus, Father, thank you that you gave me Jesus to be my Savior, who died and rose again from the dead. And I now ask Jesus to be my Savior and Lord. Some of us know the story about Jesus. Some of us know Jesus is the one who died and rose again from the dead. And we, we know all the stories, but we're just, we're just either afraid or too hard-hearted or too stubborn or too rebellious to finally surrender, give up the reins and, 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 and just to surrender and say, okay, God, God, okay, Jesus, you're my Lord. Not me, not someone else, but Jesus, you're my Lord, my one and only Lord, my one and only Savior. You got to do it. You got to do it. Now, that's the, that's the moment of repentance. Um, but now, going back to, if I can go, go back to, to Luke chapter 3, what John and what the Father wants you to know is there is a moment of repentance and there is a fruit of repentance. If you've truly turned to Jesus, it will affect your lives. It will affect your lives. It has to. It has to. I mean, I mean, the people hear this message. They hear this message. Um, you know, it, 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 our Jewishness doesn't help. If I don't change, I, I, it, God's gonna God's gonna judge me forever, burned in the fire. Uh, so, so I, I, I love what happens in verse ten. The crowd says now to John, the announcer, the Baptist. He's, they say, "Well, what should we do then?" Okay, yeah, we'll get baptized, but but if we're really repenting and showing fruit of repentance. What does that look like? What does that look like? And so John answered three things here, three things that we find here. John answered, verse 11, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. It's the same message of Jesus, of course. <laughs> They're preaching the same message. By this shall all men, all people know that you are my disciples, if you, what? Love one another. That's love. I'm willing to share. I'm willing to be kind. Now, it's very interesting. He says, shirt, if you have two shirts, not if you have two coats, <laughs> not if you have two cloaks. <laughs> if you've got two shirts, the shirt is this, right? Now, if it gets cold, I can understand that, you know, if you've got two coats, then give it to the, the guy that's cold. But, 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 but if, if we love each other, we will be concerned about the little details in each other's lives. And we want to help. If they're hungry, then we'll, we'll do what we can to, to meet that need. If they, if they're, if they're not, don't even have a proper shirt to wear, then we'll make sure that there's a shirt. There's a fellow that came into our congregation a, a year or two ago. His, the running shoes he was wearing were literally falling off his feet. Praise God, there was an extra pair of shoes, a little tight. I think he was a 10 and a half, but they were a size 10. He was able to get them on his feet. We threw out the old running shoes, and he walked out with a new pair of shoes. That's love. That's being concerned for one another. And that needs to be happy on a, on a regular basis. Share your shirts. You got an extra shirt? Show kindness, show love, show concern. Oh, I look better than you do. No, 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 no. Hey, let's be, let's, let's have sort of equal dignity, equal honor, equal beauty. <laughs> you get the idea here? Wow, that, that's John's message. See, love, love, and see, genuine love puts the other person ahead of ourselves. So if you really say that I'm turning to Jesus, then his love has to fill your heart. 
That's number one. Number two, this is pretty amazing. This is pretty amazing. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they said, what should we do? We, we've, we, we want to have a change of heart. We want to be baptized and cleansed from our sin. That's, what the, that's the picture of baptism. But, but what's that going to look like? What's that going to look like in our day-to-day lives? Now, tax collectors, they, 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 were, they were generally a nasty group of people. Uh, they would, the, the, the very chief tax collectors, they actually call them tax farmers, they would, get, they would buy a license from Rome to collect taxes with the authority to collect taxes by the authority of the Roman government. And then they would set up a hierarchy. They'd have chief tax collectors and tax collectors and tax collectors and so on in their regions where they got the li- where they'd have license to do that. And, and 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 so they would empower these guys to collect the taxes. And Rome said, "Well, you give this is the amount that we're looking for for from you. Give it to us, and we'll be happy. And if you decide that you want to tax them more, I mean, it's your people. They're going to hate you." And uh, you'll have to put up with that nonsense. But if you want more, I mean, that's up to you. That's up to you. And we'll provide the military might of Rome to back you up on this because we want our money. We want our money. So you can imagine the kind of greed. I mean, there was greed, there was corruption, and there was betrayal. I mean, tax collectors were considered the scum of society. They might have been Jewish, but they were traitors to their Jewish heritage because they were collecting taxes for the foreign government. And most of the people knew that they were, they were getting more than they, that, that, that Rome was actually requiring because the tax collectors wanted to get rich themselves. And so they weren't just taking the 1% or 2% commission. Uh, they were going for 10%, 15%. If you were rich, they'd even go for more. They wanted to gouge you out. And they didn't care if you were rich or poor. If you were poor, give us everything. Give us your house. Give us everything that's in your house. Because we have the right to take it. And in one sense, they did. But it wasn't honest. So what did John say to them? He would say this. Verse 13. Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. What? What? The amazing thing here is that John didn't say you can't be a tax collector anymore. Even though society considered that a scum job, a job that if you were genuinely Jewish, you did not take on for yourself. Wow. John did not say you got to stop being a tax collector. You know, one of the beautiful things is that when Jesus called his own disciples, and there was many that he could have chosen, but out of the crowd, he chose 12, and one of them, was a tax collector, Matthew Levi. Wow. Wow. But, but, but what was the instruction? Be honest. This is a quality that is dying quickly in our generation. To find an honest person today is difficult. Everyone is lying. Everyone's covering up. Everyone's exaggerating to make themselves look better. Honesty, honesty is not well received today. You are discouraged actually from being honest. But John says, if you're going to be a follower of God, a follower of the coming Messiah, you need to be loving, you need to be honest. Uh, There's another group of people that came to John. Here we go. (laughs) Verse 14, then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? (laughs) Wow, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Soldiers. Now, again, uh, Bible scholars, et cetera, et cetera, Bible teachers are divided on this. Were these soldiers Jewish or Gentile? Uh, Because, you see, the problem was that the Jewish nation was being subjugated by the Roman Empire. And typically, the Roman Empire did not allow a sort of a militant group to arm themselves because they would be afraid of revolt and so on. 
Now, as we see in our history nowadays, that <laughs> powers allow other subjects to be armed. For instance, that's one of the problems in Haiti. Uh, the government has arms, but so do the gangs. Uh, we see that in the Middle East as well, taking place. Hamas has got tanks and brigades and armor and rockets and that kind of stuff. They're living in Israel. Very interesting. Here they're supposed to be occupied, and yet they've got military arms. Uh, I'm not sure if that would have been true in Israel back in those days. The Romans would have made sure that the general population did not have too much arm armament to fight back and revolt. Now, you can't take all the weapons away, but I'm sure that most of the weapons, especially organized, would have been taken away. Now, there were some exceptions, of course. Uh, the temple, because it was holy, 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 there would have been armed guards, armed soldiers guarding the temple area. There would have been hundreds, if not thousands, of soldiers available to do that task. I am not sure if there would have been others. Some have suggested that the tax collectors would have needed soldiers. I, my best understanding of that is that the Romans themselves would have provided soldiers because they, the tax collectors were ta collecting taxes for the Roman government and uh, Rome was lending their might and security for the tax collectors because uh, Rome wanted their money. Um, so were they Jewish or Gentile? Not sure. I'm going to assume that they're Gentiles for a moment which makes this even more interesting because here come these Gentile, non-Jewish soldiers to John and say, okay, we're soldiers, we want to repent, and, and we want to be part of the family of God. We, we want to get baptized. And John doesn't say to them, you can't. You're not Jewish, you can't. Oh, because it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. He's already talked about that. <laughs> Don't say that we're Abraham's children. No, no, God can raise up the stones. He can raise up Roman soldiers. <laughs> So if they were Roman soldiers, this is even more amazing because John is basically saying, yeah, you can repent. You can be baptized. Well, what, do, what does repent mean? What does it look like? What does the fruit of repentance look like for us? And there's probably many ways of being able to maybe articulate this. John simply says this. Um, don't, uh, sorry, he says, uh, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. I've kind of summarized those three things. Humility. Humility. You see, these Roman soldiers, they were well-trained, hardened men who were given, trained to be confident, to take charge of situations and provide security and whatever necessary means to provide security in the area. They didn't take guff from every, anybody. And sometimes they would overstep their authority thinking that because they're so strong and they're tough, they're hardened bodies, hardened minds, hardened mission, that they could do whatever they want. And so if they wanted your money, they would come up with some way of getting their money from, from you. If, if uh, uh, they, had, they had the authority to you know, make you carry their armor for a mile, and they would sometimes uh, <laughs> make you carry it two or three or four, because they were just tough and rude guys. And they, they had that overconfidence of being military soldiers. And John says, don't extort. Don't extort the people. And don't accuse people falsely so that you can beat them up. Don't tell tales. Don't, you, you take responsibility for your own actions. And don't blame it on the crowds. Don't br blame it on other people. You, you, you don't accuse people falsely. And Thirdly, and be content with your pay. You see, that's what repentance means. I'm content with the blessings of God. And it may not be what my human body craves for at this particular moment, but I need to learn to be content because there's a great reward coming when Jesus comes again. And that's where my focus ought to be. So I, there needs to be that humility in, in us, not thinking that we're better than we actually are. It's only by the grace of God we are what we are. Amen? So if we're going to really be a people that repent, uh, we need to share our shirts. <laughs> we need to be honest tax collectors, and we need to be humble soldiers. <laughs> wow. That's what repentance looks like. That's the fruit of repentance.
Now, as people are hearing this, boy, this sure sounds like Jesus. Well, it ought to sound like Jesus because John is announcing the coming of Jesus. Their messages ought to be, and they are the same. So if John is saying this to us, Jesus is saying the same thing to us. As a matter of fact, the people even wondered, well, is it possible that John is actually the Messiah? He just hasn't told us that. He's trying to be sort of incognito, kind of sort of, uh, you know, uh, disguising himself a little bit here so he can walk a little more easily up among the crowds. And so actually, verse 15, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. When you truly repent and you're ready to take those steps of bearing fruit of repentance, love, um, love and um, honesty and humility, um, when you do that, then that's, that's repentance. Um, I'll baptize you. I'll baptize you. A, a picture of your sin being washed away, being part now of the family of God. I'll baptize you with water. Uh, but one who is more powerful than I will come. Wow, I'm not the Messiah. There's one who is absolutely more powerful. Now, the description here, so you get the sense of John's own personal humility, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Now, I just discovered that this past week here, in in my study here, that there's actually a cultural, um, uh, sort of a cultural thing here. It's not just, you know, I'm not worthy to to carry his shoes, Matthew records. Uh, Luke says, Luke records John saying, I'm not worthy worthy even to untie his sandals. Um, It's actually a cultural thing that takes place here. Uh, You see, uh, a slave had to do whatever his master wanted him to do. But a teacher would gather disciples around him, and the disciples, or the learners, the students, would want to do favors for the teacher to show that they were loyal to him. So they would, you know, they would wash his clothes, do his laundry, they would provide meals for him. They would, you know, they they would just take care of him any way they could, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, but there's limits to that. You didn't you didn't humiliate your students, so you didn't make them grovel. You didn't put their face into the dirt. Oh, you've got to untie my shoe. And then so they have to get right down on their knees and, and, and put their nose into the dirt to untie your sandals. No, 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 no. A, a teacher didn't do that. But on the other hand, a servant in a house, a slave in the house would have to do that. Whatever the master required, whatever the master required, that slave would have to do. If it meant getting your nose in the dirt to take off the shoes of the master, so be it. And then you'll wash your master's feet, those stinky, smelling feet, and your nose is right into the dirt. John is saying here, he is so much greater, I'm not even worthy to put my nose in the dirt to untie his sandals and then wash his dirty feet. I'm not even that worthy. He is that great. So John is the announcer but it's all about Jesus. Their message is the same, but it's all about Jesus. See, John's message came from Jesus. There needs to be repentance. There needs to be that moment of repentance. There needs to be that fruit of repentance, those actions of love and honesty and humility, but it's all about Jesus. John would go on to say about Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will fill you. He will dip you into the Spirit. The Spirit will be in you and fill you, motivate you, guide you, convict you, convince you, comfort you. Hallelujah, praise God. He will baptize you with fire. Now, when it says fire here, some folks have thought, well, maybe it's the fire of Pentecost. (laughs) Little flames that were on the heads of the people on the day of Pentecost. But no, 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 no. Actually, if we put it in the context here, John's going to help us understand what that fire is. It, it cleanses. It purifies. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you will not be the same. You cannot continue to live your own life. You're following Jesus. And that means a life now of love and of honesty and humility. Amen? Amen? Uh, he would put it this way. Uh, he would say... Um, Verse 17, his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
It's a farming picture. We're not, we're not familiar with it. But after the wheat is brought into the, uh, uh, has been harvested and brought in, it's run over a few times to, to, to uh, break the seal between the actual kernels of wheat and the, the hard shell that's surrounding each kernel, which is the chaff. And, and then you take that pitchfork and you take it to the threshing floor and you, with that pitchfork, you would throw up the wheat into the air and the grain would fall, but the chaff would be blown in the gentle breeze. And so on the threshing floor, that platform built oftentimes on the top of the hill so you could catch the breeze, the chaff is blown off to the side, but the, 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 the wheat, the true kernels of grain are there and you can take them in and then you can grind them into to, to flour to make bread and so on. But the chaff, what do you do with the chaff? Well, it's just, you can't do anything with it. Can't eat it. There's no nutritional value. Just get stuck in your gut. <laughs> just give you, that, that'll make a mess. No, you just burn it and get it out of the way. Can't do anything with that. You just burn that and get that out of the way. But there's going to be a purifying work that God is going to do in your hearts by the Spirit because you're a follower of Jesus. Now, I, I, I do want to add verse 18 to this because it's powerful. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the, what? Good news to them. You can be part of the family of God. You can experience the transworking, um, the transworking power of the Spirit of Jesus in you if you repent and if by His power, His grace, the grace of Jesus, move in a new direction in your actions and your attitudes of love, of honesty, and humility. And this is good news because it will show that you have truly been washed of your sins and it will show that you really belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. And he's encouraged them with good news. You see, Jesus is good news. Have you embraced the good news? Have you embraced it? Have you repented? Have there, has there been that moment of repentant, repentance and is there now that fruit of repentance in your life? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. God bless you. God bless you.